Good afternoon and welcome to Wyatt's live living room sessions. Last week Thursday, I had an eye-opening discussion with renowned Barbadian artist Annalie Davis exploring how her work addresses several elements of regenerative agriculture and climate resilience. I highly recommend that you catch the recording session on Wyatt's YouTube channel. Remember, living room sessions are now being streamed live to YouTube, so be sure to check it out, check us out there, click and subscribe. Today's session, we will be returning to the creative sector. So if you're joining us for the first time, you're in for a special treat. From today, Thursday, and every Tuesday and Thursday thereafter, we will be moving to a new time of 1 p.m. In our sessions, we will continue to explore the topics of regenerative agriculture, climate change, building biodiversity, and renewable energy. My name is Keisha Farnham, and I am from Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education, and Design, or WIRED. And we are pleased to bring you this series in collaboration with our education partners, the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. Our very special guest today is Israel Mapp, creative producer, architect, product designer, and potter. Today, we're looking at the regenerative, at regenerative development and climate change out of the lens of creative placemaking and urban spaces. Israel's work spans the full spectrum of design from architecture, interior design, event design, and set and stage design to product design and manufacturing. He is also the founder of the nonprofit social creative enterprise Union Collaborative Inc. and Tandem Movement, an artist, designers, and makers collective. Welcome, Israel. It is indeed a pleasure to have you with us here today. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice. Hey, <laughs> there I am. <laughs> so good to see you. Where are you joining us from today? I am in St. James, um, on the edge of Apes Hill, Polo, and Golf Field. Yeah. Ah, there we go. All right, so right, right here in Barbados. Excellent. Yeah, right here in Barbados. Right here in Barbados. All right, yeah. so Israel, if you could just start us off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Ah, uh, okay. So, as you described, um, I'm a creative producer, an architect, product designer, and more recently, a potter. And so, essentially, I've been working and living within the creative industries from the time I was a child. Uh, my dad is a full-time artist, he's a painter. Oh, and nice. I, I pretty much lived in an art studio um, where there were paintings in and around me all the time. Um, I think I, my bedroom was a storage unit for painting. <laughs> right? um, so, and that's really influenced how I see the world, how I work with people um and how i value things that are made and designed and thought of um ah. essentially yeah so from a very early age you had that influence yes. um we're gonna put a picture up on the screen and if you uh, could just tell us tell us what's happening here <laughs> <laughs> give us an idea of what's happening here in this picture oh uh, wow okay so um the first vignette that's me on a potter's wheel and that's actually at the Barbados Community College a couple years ago. That's where I, where I got my training in pottery by um, Gloria Chung. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually throwing clay on a wheel. I haven't done it in a couple weeks. Um, so I really wanted people to see this. Um, I really find joy in this because it brings balance. Understand as an architect, I spend most of my time on a computer, working with crisp white sheets of paper. And with pottery, I actually get to be messy. Um, and I get to experiment on things that, um, that the material allows you to. Yeah. Right? And it's a, a shorter runway. Like, you can see it happen right before your eyes. But when you're designing a building, it's like months um, on the drawing board before you actually break ground. So yeah. pottery brings. Um, Balance. Instant gratification. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Instant creative gratification. There we go. Yeah. That sounds better. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Talking so talking about creative, let's let's mm -hmm. jump straight into the discussion. Um yeah. because I, I had to do some research on this too as well. So this I mean, this is a very, very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Um and as an organization, why did we always look at the design element and how mm -hmm. that fits into the regenerative cycle? Um mm -hmm. so this is really an exciting um detour into some of the areas that I think a lot of us don't think about when mm -hmm. we think about regenerative development or even when we think about climate change. All right. right. So let's start uh, with the first question, looking mm -hmm. at creative placemaking. Um, mm -hmm. What is creative placemaking and what are some of the examples that, that are of, of it in Barbados and the wider region? Okay. So it's, there's a very succinct um, description of what it is. But essentially, creative, creative placemaking is a field of practice that intentionally leverages the power of the arts and culture and creativity to serve a community, um, serve the community's interests while driving a broader agenda for change and growth and transformation. And that way, it also builds character and quality in the space. So um, when you think of development, I think a lot of us are very familiar with um, in Barbados when you're thinking about development. Let's just use tourism as an example. Mm -hmm. You would have a golf course being the center of the development when it has like residences and those things. So that's one form. Um, even more recently, we have the International Racetrack and they've used that as a center for their development where they also have activities in and around the racetrack, including residential and commercial. But right. with, yeah, so with this, you're actually using the arts and um, it's not limited to exhibitions and shows and the performative end, but it also speaks to productive end. So all those activities that fuel the value chain and supply chain and everything is broadens the, the development. Um, so we have a couple of examples in the Caribbean. Have you been to Cuba, Keisha? No, I actually oh. had a trip planned and it got canceled. Oh, and I, for some reason, have not been able to get back there as yet. But it is on my bucket list. Okay. Um, so it, it's going to happen. You know, once it gets to my bucket list, it's going to happen. It's so gonna it's happen. going to happen. Definitely, okay. yes. So you can go you with get... me if you want. Oh, great. <laughs> if you've been, then I, I could do it a guide. So <laughs> no problem. <laughs> my Spanish is not good. Um, so when we get there, we're going to go to Frabica de Arte Cubo, Cubano. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is uh, an artist relocation project and a creative and cultural cluster. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially they found an old oil mill and they have um, adaptively reused the building to host a lot of activities with regards to the arts. So they actually have dance, they have music, they have um, the visual arts and, and it's totally accessible. Um, we have a new movement in Kingston, Jamaica called Kingston Creative. And they have been able to galvanize and mobilize a wide cross section of people to bring interest to, to Kingston. Um, many people are afraid of Kingston, but I, when I used to live in Jamaica, um, it's the most beautiful, energetic place. And they've I, brought- I more, agree with you. Yes? I agree with you. Yeah, right. 100%. So they started to engage the community and looking at ways of transforming it through murals, um, marketplaces for artists, um, and it brings a lot of activity and interest, right? Socially and economically. And then we have our brothers and sisters in um, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there's a space I like to talk about. It's, um, they actually started at the same time we did. Um, it's called East Yard. And mm -hmm. they, their work is primarily based in community and public arts. So they actually use art as um, learning and development. They use yeah. it to, to not only train, but also to deal with social issues. Mm -hmm. But they've created a, a whole space around it. And their core creative activity is actually film, um, which is a which is very innovative for this part of, of, of the world. Right? Yeah. Um, and then at home, um, we can't forget about um, Oysters. Yeah. Oysters is, it uses food, which mm -hmm. is an art to create social and economic activity. And it's actually quite regenerative. 
Um, it connects with agriculture, it connects with tourism. It's one of the successful placemaking um, projects in Barbados. You know, I, I actually never thought about oysters in that in that manner. Yeah. So you gave us a textbook definition of creative placemaking, and then you gave us some examples. If you had to just put it in your own words, uh, easy layman's explanation, what yeah. is creative placemaking? Right. So a friend of mine, um, friend of mine, he, he coined it in like a, a couple of words, and I said to him, I'm going to use this <laughs> this is so succinct. Um, thank you, Everett. Um, he said, why don't you just say to people, you just make their place chill, right? <laughs> and I'm like, that is it. I'm going to use that, that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, it's you're really making a place for people to come together that is organic and meaningful. Um, right. And it's not only connected to the things like retail, um, where you're buying and selling, but it's more about connecting to emotions and values that we all hold. Mm -hmm. um, and you connect it to a built place, right? This is where we come together, that we come to cluster and we share, um, yeah. right? And it's inclusive, so it's, it, no one is left out. There, right. is, there is space for everyone. So essentially that's what placemaking is, yeah? For me. Oh, that's that's an excellent description. Um, honestly, when I started to look it up um, and we started to talk about it, mm -hmm. I realized how closely it is linked with Wired's own ethos of design mm -hmm. thinking as a process for creative problem solving. And that's mm -hmm. what the design in Wired actually refers to, having a design thinking approach mm -hmm where um, the creating prop the creative problem solving process is taking place and it encourages us to focus on people the people that we serve right so there's a human yeah. element that social element mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. and, and in doing that in focusing on the people that we serve it then leads to the creation of human-centered products services internal processes um, yes, exactly. but we also take into consideration the environment and the natural world right and how we express and how our expressions um the problem solving that we're coming up the designs that we're coming up with how mm -hmm. it also addresses the need of the natural environment um and so we're always tr constantly trying to hold meaningful space for multimedia arts to be experienced throughout our landscape um you know we try to incorporate uh, cultural elements visual arts music dance storytelling in the work that we're doing and it's the reason why we've um we've we've included in these sessions persons like yourself um, right. persons like Annalie davis persons mm -hmm. like uh, taisha carrington and some other persons who will be coming in the future but right. having that whole inclusive element of how do you make sure that your product addresses one the people that you serve but also it addresses the natural environment mm -hmm. and i think that segues really nicely into the second part of our discussion because looking at your projects, um, there's, a, there's a clear link between regenerative development and your creative placemaking process. So how does your projects, how do the projects that you have, the projects that you use, mm -hmm. um, the projects that you create, mm -hmm. um, how do they use creative placemaking as a strategy towards regenerative development? Right. Um, so we are currently working on two projects. Um, one is urban. Mm -hmm. and one is rural. And uh, we, one is called Union at Beckwith, that is in the city of Bridgetown. Mm -hmm. And the other is um, Golden Calabash, which is in Baxter, St. Andrew. Um, and it's just, just by interacting with different creatives that we get to do these things. Yeah. Um, so with Union at Beckwith, um, we're taking a underutilized property in the northwestern quadrant of the city. And uh, we, we partner, we're partnering with the property owners first. Um, so here it is that you have a private sector company and mm -hmm. here we have a, a civil society um, organization. Right. And essentially they approach us, right? Which is a long story. We don't need to get into that right now. Maybe another episode we can do that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, they saw what we were doing in one of their properties 
and they saw the change that was happening because of it, right? Mm -hmm. So with Tandem Movement, as you mentioned, it was an artist collective. We had a store um, in the Colonnade Mall. And because of the type of people being there and the interest we were creating, we, we drive a lot of activity into the mall. And they asked us, you know, could you, would you like to look at this property? Sure, we looked at this, we went over, and it was about, it is about 12,000 square feet of interior space and about 5,000 square feet of exterior space. And we, they asked us what we we're gonna do. And I said, we're gonna do what we're doing in the other property, but on steroids. We're going to <laughs> turn all of this square footage into creative, productive spaces. So understanding what the city is like right now is just all retail and maybe government offices. There yeah. aren't many productive spaces, especially no. for artists. Or green um, spaces. Or green spaces for that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we said, you know, we're going to solve your problem while solving our problem. And the activities that we're going to host in there were are to allow artists who and designers who don't have access to tools and space and programming to produce their work. Mm -hmm. And we have a bias towards work that is, um, let's say, recyclable work as well. So we're looking at the same way how we've taken a, a disused building, we've made it into something. We mm -hmm. take materials that are being disused and think about it in a different way and produce, use it as material for new works. Right. And um, so that's one of the things that we are doing, and it's bringing activity to the city. So right. what Can that you give does, me an example? Could you give me an example of of one of the reuse elements that you would have that you would have uh, that we're working on? Yeah. Right. So the first one is uh, very simple. We are taking well, it's our project for us, but we're hoping mm -hmm. that we'll scale it up and it will make more sense. So it's two projects in one. Um, mm -hmm. We're taking furniture that's being um, dumped and we find them on the street and we, we take them in mm -hmm. um, because for some people they they don't really appreciate that there is still value in things right it may not look the same it may not function the same but we are able actually as artists and designers to see the additional value um, and we take the furniture in and we reupholster it for ourselves so we can fit out our space right yeah the added thing to that is the zero waste concept where we're right. getting um clothing and garments that were also um uh dumped and mm -hmm. we are making textiles from those right okay, so awesome. the textile yeah. is then used to reupholster the furniture right wow. so it's like okay. a full, it's a full process it's a full cycle a full, excellent full yeah cycle, right mm -hmm. um so in that way there's like as you said there's um this this transfer of knowledge and mm -hmm. people get to look at things a little bit differently. Um, so in that way, we kind of reduce the amount of waste entering our landfill. Mm -hmm. We are also extending the life of things. Um, I mean, uh, if you can imagine where the furniture came from, a lot of our furniture isn't made in Barbados anymore, it's right. actually imported. Mm -hmm. So you think about where that material is coming from. Um, we call it the carbon miles. Like had yeah. to take a trip to get here. Um, and all of these things help incrementally with our natural environment, right? Exactly, yeah. So um, that's it in a nutshell, essentially, to the, yeah. So when we look at uh, one of the things uh, that we look at in, in at Wired, um, mm -hmm. in terms of our regenerative design and our natural patterns is mm -hmm. kind of including all different forms of capital, right? Mm -hmm. um, and through our built environment, through our ecosystem services, how do we include the different forms of capital? Um, we use a, an eight forms of capital framework, but applicable mm. to this conversation, we're looking at the social capital, the experiential capital, the cultural capital, and the material uh, capital, with mm -hmm. the material referring to built infrastructure. Right. Um, so how does how does your your work look at um, the the cultural district? Um, how does it look at you know um, the creative and cultural industry cluster? You know that mm -hmm. that kind of thing. How how does that right. incorporate into this? Right. So the other. <clears throat> There are different ways of approaching placemaking. And mm -hmm. um, at Union at Beckwith, we are 
we're doing it incrementally, but we're going to hit like five of the seven ways. Um, so I mentioned artist low relocation. Right. Um, essentially providing space to, to artists who and designers who, who need the space. A lot of us work on our dining room tables. I mean, now in amidst COVID, we are doing that. Um, but when all that changes out, we're providing the space. So it's essentially artist relocation, right? Yeah. Um, but Luckily, creativity can happen anyway. Well, Even yeah. at home on the dining table. <laughs> yes. Um, because it requires creativity to see things that way. Yes. Um, so the next step on that is actually clustering, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a form of social engineering. Um, I mean, cities are essentially clusters, right? If you think about them, where people yeah. come together to do certain things and amazing things happen, um, either by pragmatic ways or just organic coalescence of things. Yeah. Um, so we, we're about the, the clustering, right? Mm -hmm. So when you cluster, you get these intersections between different disciplines. And it's, it's not always between creative people. It could be something more technical or yeah. something, um, in our case, governmental. We're working with government as well. So you have these things coming together and producing amazing things. Um, and clustering is really good in terms of the use of resources, right? Um, you have shared resources. You actually accomplish um, a lot, especially once you see where things align. And we think that's important because a lot of us singularly cannot achieve much, but we can get to our, what do you call it? Critical mass when we Critical work Critical mass, yeah, you're right, you're right. right. I mean, our, our founding director, he has an expression that he loves to use. What is sometimes that? drives me a little bit crazy, which is stacking functions. He's like, how oh. are we stacking functions? We need to what stack functions. Mean? But what you know, it, it's so practical because every single thing that we do at Wired um, and even the way that we partner. So for example, with, you know, this living room sessions, we're partnering with our education partners, CPRI, but right. there's so many other elements of every single project that that we execute, um, partnering with the different stakeholders, partnering mm -hmm. with the different sectors, because everybody brings, everybody has, lim one, one, everybody has limited resources. Mm -hmm. And two, everybody brings a little bit of something to the table. But as you say, with a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, you build right. that critical mass. And then you get that input from different aspects, which yes. gives it that holistic lens um, yeah. because you may not be seeing it, you know, as an, as a, as a farmer, you may not be seeing it one way as an artist, you may not be seeing it one way as a scientist, you may not be seeing it one way. Right. And then you have all these different perspectives, um, mm -hmm. coming into the room and bringing the space alive, you know? Yes, exactly. I, yeah. I, you say it really well there just now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, because I mean, uh, honestly, the, the, the whole element of design, it is, just, it, we're always looking to, make sure that we combine the arts, culture, education, community mm -hmm. involvement, mm -hmm. and seeing how that combination can shift people's view mm -hmm. of themselves, but also shift their view of how they interact with their built environment, their mm -hmm. landscape, and their you know green or natural environment. You know? So yeah. looking at, if you're just joining us, I'm, I'm, I'm reframing so that you know who we're talking to and what we're talking about. Uh, I am speaking with Israel Mapp, creative producer, architect, product designer, Potter, um, and he's the founder of the nonprofit Social Creative Enterprise Union Collaborative Inc. and Tandem Movement, which is an artist designers and makers collective. Um, Israel, why is mm -hmm. it important for us to create cities that have a negligible or even better yet a positive impact on our environment um so if we if we return to what we we're talking about the idea of clustering yeah um there are some negative aspects to that if you think of the amount of people and the activity supporting these people in one space mm -hmm. um, can be detrimental to the natural environment let's take for example sewage right um so um, we are going to produce waste and it has to go somewhere. And because all of us are in this one space, it does negatively impact wherever that waste is disposed of or treated. There is a, there is, there is a challenge, right? So yeah. 
it's important for us to really think about our cities as as engine rooms, but to foster to foster these activities that we that we enjoy, right? Yeah. yeah. This is where we live. This is where we work. This is where we play. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you do this? So with us, um, with us, we we started. We have a, for example, we have a courtyard, right, in our building, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> one of the it's one of the last courtyards, original courtyards in the city, and where a lot of the courtyards that are not there now have been filled in, in response to this clustering, right, because landowners wanted to have more built environment space to 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 be able to lease right we yeah. decided we're not going to lose our courtyard right because the courtyard in addition to being beautiful mm -hmm. is also a microclimate right um oh great photos i was wondering when these were going to come <laughs> up right so <laughs> so what you're looking at um the photo top right um, that's a photo of the courtyard, I think in 2017, um, where we had just started to look at the building. And as much as it's a, a, a place to recreate, um, we also acknowledge that it's a microclimate. Um, right. This courtyard moderates the temperatures of the rooms surrounding it. Imagine this building when it was built in the 1900s when it didn't have um, air conditioning. This courtyard made sense because of natural ventilation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously now because we're right on the street and you have carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide from the, um, from the street, we have to air condition the buildings, but the microclimate still helps, right? It still helps in keeping the, the temperature of the overall building low so the air conditioning units do not have to work as hard, um, as hard and consume as much energy. Um, so these are things that um, uh, developers can think of when they're in the cities. How best can we use our land space to help us um, design better buildings, yeah. um, right? And because at the end of the day, we are going, all of our activities happen in buildings, right? Um, yeah. We're having an interview here right now. I'm in my house, you're in your house. Um, we are working in buildings, right? Yes. So um, how do we make those buildings? Yeah. How right. do we so make we have those to be buildings as environmentally friendly as possible. Really, as friendly yeah. as possible. Um, so that's that's one end. Um, we are also partnering with another, um, what do you call it? Uh, another nonprofit, the Sojourner Foundation, which is they're working agriculture, mm -hmm. and instead of just having ornamentals in the courtyard, we're actually mm -hmm. growing food. Uh, so we're partnering nice. with them mm -hmm. to see how we can bring food, growing a production of food um, in the urban space. Um, and I think we're ready for that now. I think it's not too far from our perspective as something that we can do. So we start to think of cities a, a little bit differently. Um, yeah and how we use space. So I think, can you bring back up that um, slide again, Patrick? Right. Um, so what I wanted to show you on the top left, um, that is essentially Bridgetown. Mm -hmm. um, I know that everyone thinks St. Michael is Bridgetown, but St. Michael is not Bridgetown. Um, Bridgetown is a very specific area. Um, and I wanted to show you like the yellow bits. Mm -hmm. Yellow bits, those are, um, those are the open spaces. So you have Queens Park, we have Jubilee Gardens, we have Independence Square, we have um, Hero Square, all those yellow bits, yeah. um, right? Um, then if you can see the red bits, right? Those are the culturally intensive spaces in our city. There's actually quite a bit. Lots yeah. of museums, mm -hmm. um, performance spaces, um, and those are in red. And the one in blue on the mm -hmm. far left, um, I call that creative productive spaces. So that's like Pelican Village. Right. Um, right. 
And then you see the one in green, that's the new part that's going to happen, I guess, within the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, what's it going to be called again? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm fresh well, up, sorry. <laughs> the new part that's going to be in <laughs> two years. That's what it's called for now. <laughs> maybe maybe somebody in our audience can give us an idea. Type in the name if you know what the name is. <laughs> right. And then you see those bits in purple. Those are the new spaces coming up. So we have the Empire Theater and we have Union at Beckwith, right? Yes. Um, the reason why I highlighted this is to show you how they punctuate the city. And um, in addition to being recreational, they're, it's important that we maintain these because they're lungs of the city, not only socially, but as microclimates. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, people admit that they do go into Independence Square to have lunch. Um, it's actually one of the cooler in terms of temperature spaces mm -hmm. in the city, um, yeah. right? So all these things which are creative in their thought um, help us to, to come together as 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 people in a city, um, so yeah. that's that's why it's it's, it's important. Um, and I mean, microclimates are so easy to identify because you, as you yeah. said, it's it's so the gratification is instant. You you get into the space and you immediately feel the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, when we do tours um, at Workers Reserve for areas, the, you right. take piece of, persons through the areas that haven't been regenerated as yet, and you go into one of our oldest areas, um, mm -hmm. which is about six years and mm -hmm. of, of tree growth. And, you know, as soon as you start to approach that area, you start to feel the temperature drop immediately um, and you feel the difference. So I could imagine within a city space mm -hmm. where, the, you know, it's so densely packed. Bridgetown is very densely packed. Yes, very um, packed. How yeah. those spaces have such an, a positive impact. And yes. I mean, it's it's such a great intersection too. Um, and thank you very much for you know showing that on the map because I think I've I've just learned something too as well. Um, but it definitely shows how we do have the spaces to consider and uh, make sure it, that when, to consider that when we're de designing them to make sure that the whole mm -hmm. elements of design and arts that they come together to be able to engage nature, right? And that right. they're not only for artistic expression or cultural right. expression, but it's also to drive persons towards environmental stewardship and protection of yeah. our natural world, even within urban spaces. If anything, for urban spaces. Like, I yeah. like the idea, and I say it's an idea, but it's something that I live by every day. It's like, it is 40 every day. Yes. And really, it shouldn't just be allocated for a particular discipline. It is for the everyday. Um, and it's great that a lot of the cultural spaces lead right out to parks, right? Yeah. It, may, it makes sense. If you think about it, like the new um, village, village green next mm -hmm. to the Central Bank, it leads out from the Grand Salle. It leads out from the Frank Colomo Hall. And yeah. if you think about how we use space, like you can use, you can use these public spaces every day. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so Karen Jordan says that the that the park is called Golden Square Park. Yay! Uh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Karen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, I I know that we do have a couple of questions from the audience, and we have a bit of the discussion to go through. Um, we have questions. Still. Yeah, yeah, we have questions. We have oh, questions wow. from the audience. Um, so, <laughs> when you when you think about the responsibility of art, design, uh, place making mm -hmm. uh, in this era of climate change, mm -hmm. in your view, what is the responsibility, or is there a responsibility for um, artists, for designers, um, mm -hmm. for people who practice creative place making um, okay. within this space of climate change that we're in right now? I'm going to take it. I'm going to take that question from the perspective of designers, and when I say designers, I'm talking about architects, product designers. I'm talking about fashion designers. I'm talking about people who, even people who design systems, right? Right. Um, yeah. um, you, everything that we use, mm -hmm. like you're looking in front of you at a computer. You're looking at your desks. You're looking. Everything that we use has been designed by someone. Yeah. All right. And it's been made by several people. Um, the responsibility comes in 
on what is this object you are creating? What, what, is it a useful function? Um, does it add value to the life of people? Or is it just a, a what's the word, tchotchke? Like, mm -hmm. what does it, how many times can you design a water bottle, right? And put it out there and it's driven by marketing. How many, how many things that we see so often bring value to humanity? Not many, right? It's like, yeah. do you ever think about what you're making um, as a designer? Like you design it, you think about where are you getting these materials from? Mm -hmm. um, how long will it live with someone? And would it be able to be fixed in the future so you can extend the life? So yeah. within the last couple of decades, you know, we've become very disposable with everything that we do because it was designed that way. Yeah. And that, I mean, it has an economic benefit to the designer and the maker, the manufacturer and the company that holds everything. But mm -hmm. ultimately nature suffers. So as a designer, you have to rethink really about and convince your patron that, yeah. that it has more benefit to you, to your future family, um, to have something that has a life that can live along with people that yes. maybe it can be transformed. Maybe at the end of one life, it becomes something else. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a, a strong, Oh, look at that. <laughs> Memories. Um, <laughs> so I think that's one of the major responsibilities as, as designers, especially really think about what you're doing and what you're making. Yeah. Um, and who you're making it for and what's the value to humanity, you know? Right. Um, Tell us what's happening here in this picture. Well, that is some recycling going on, <laughs> right? So you see those boxes? Uh-huh. Right, so this was in our the tandem store that we that we had and we're soon going to reopen. So mm -hmm. um, you can hold your breath. I encourage you to hold your breath. <laughs> um, so we started out with a, a blank sheet of a room, like white walls, white ceiling, white floors. Actually, no, not white floors. We had laminated floors. And, um, and we got these, we've been collecting these boxes for a while. These boxes used to hold all the coins um, minted for Barbados. So the oh. central bank would dump these boxes, okay. right? So they yeah. dispose of the boxes. And a few creative people would fight for these boxes because they're cute, right? You can they are stuff. cute, yeah. They're they are boxes, really cute, yeah. Right? yeah. Actually, if you zoom in, you could probably see Prabhik de Canada uh -huh. um, on them. So we use these as shelving units in the store, um, and we had fun using sisal and hooks, and we just played around with it. Um, Excellent. Right, so just imagine a whole space with them and it created a lot of interest. Yeah. And I think as, as a designer and an installer, it was also very stimulating um, doing that. I think we also inspired a couple of people to do the same in their houses. So from time to time we get, um, we get requests for those boxes. <laughs> do you have any more boxes? So like, I could oh, imagine. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, so that's, that's really part of our ethos. Um, we we look at things and see what the possibilities are um, from them like before they before we have to dispose of them. Right? Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we that we always look at at Wired is how we try to focus on design as a tool for teaching, and mm. building capacity, mm -hmm. um, and we try to make sure that we are inclusive. So we try to make sure that we take into consideration youth um, in general, but also vulnerable youth, uh, women, differently abled, um, and, and older groups too as well. Trying to empower persons to make valuable contributions to the natural landscape of Barbados. Okay. Your uh, union at Betwick site, mm -hmm. Uh, how does it foster resilience, uh, safety, inclusivity, and, mm -hmm. and sustainability in Bridgetown? Okay, so we do it in two ways. Um, so when we first wrote our proposal, um, we recognized that because it was a, a underutilized building, and it essentially takes up an entire block. So if I frame this for you, 
It is um, Lower Broad Street, mm -hmm. um, Prince Alfred Street, um, Nile Street, and Hink Street. It's a, okay, it's not, yeah. right? Um, so it's an entire block. And incidentally, a lot of the buildings in and around that area, there isn't any activity. So the only activity happening there is one of Barbados's popular fast food restaurants, which I will not plug right now. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so we share the space uh -huh. for them, but uh -huh. essentially the majority of it is empty. Um, by having activities in that space alone, right? Yeah. And as designers and artists, we work 24 hours because when the inspiration hits you, it hits you and you have to make. Yeah. So by doing that, you create activity. And through activity, you there's a less dark street. There is less loneliness on the street. Mm -hmm. And having people around creates this level of security, right? And yeah. it's very natural. It's, um, oh, there we go, we got some photos. Um, so we have, actually that's Fresh Milk's last um, art residence on the top left. Um, they visited the site. Oh, um, that's Annalie Davis's Fresh Milk. Annalie Davis, yeah, yes. the Fresh mm -hmm. um, And we're hoping to partner with them really soon. Excellent. Um, yeah, because we're all about partnering right now. <laughs> and, it makes sense. It just makes sense. Right. Stack functions. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, the other level of security is, I think, what they call it in development um, slang, it's um, citizen security. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> development speak. <laughs> yes, you have to say these words, right? <laughs> yes, right. definitely. Okay. Um, so we're helping to harness the raw talent oh, and enable, amazing. I know, right? Um, yeah. To enable people to monetize what their talent essentially and develop their businesses um, yeah. and to have economic and social benefits. Um, so by doing this, you empower them, right? Yeah. You allow them to get that coin um, and they're able to feed themselves. They're able to sustain themselves where money is required. Right? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, those are the two main things that I can see that we do. But there, I mean, there's so much, there's so, as we do stuff, we don't realize what we're doing until someone yeah. says, you're doing this. I'm like, oh, I didn't know we were doing this. Yeah. So. My advice to you is make sure that you start documenting. So start, start uh, doing like a, a photo journey, start doing, um, you know, short video clips, because I think, uh -huh. um, the the space that you're in, inhabiting is is uh, very versatile and mm -hmm. flexible and is pivotal and will change the face of Bridgetown um, We're in a very positive yeah in yeah. a very positive way and it already has started doing that so mm -hmm. you need to document that um, before we go into questions from the audience um, we are speaking to Israel Mack creative producer architect uh, product designer and Potter and founder of the nonprofit Social Creative Enterprise Union Collaborative Inc. and Tandem Movement, which is an artist designers and makers collective. And we've been talking about all the great work that they're doing and how they incorporate regenerative development and take into consideration climate change, resilience elements within their work. Um, so let's move into questions from the audience. Uh, all right, our first question from the audience uh, is from Jamal and it's on YouTube. Yeah, so welcome to our YouTube listeners. We are streaming live on YouTube, so make sure you click and subscribe. Um, you said you're developing two spaces, one in an urban setting and one in a rural setting. Are there any major cultural considerations that have to be taken into account for each space? Good question, Jamal. Oh, that's a good question. Get rid of Jamal, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> 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 All right, so <laughs> um, I don't know. It's 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 interesting. One of the cultural considerations um, is um, that we found, especially in the urban condition, um, it's that Barbadians love things that are shiny and new, right? Don't and we all? <laughs> I think that's a Caribbean person thing. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> As a Trinidadian, I think that's a Caribbean okay, person right, thing. Fine, but go fine, ahead. Right. Yes. Okay, right. So 
Um, it's taken us a while for, and we're still fighting it. It's taken us a long while for individuals to adopt our project as we would like, um, because it's not shiny, it's mm -hmm. not new, and we're not developing the the project like a typical development project where you either knock down the building and build something, a new edifice, or yeah. you throw so much money at it that it starts to glitter, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that facility. We're using whatever we have and make it useful, right? Right. Um, so that's one of the major considerations is to get the buy-in and- Which is very much a permaculture principle too. Ah, it is. You know, yeah. looking at the space as you mm -hmm. have it and as using the it. space and using the elements within the space. Um, mm -hmm. To, to make sure that you get the best results. And it's yeah, not yeah. always pretty. It's not, you know, this, you know, cultured, designed God. Yeah. It, it doesn't always look like that. And so right. sometimes it's difficult for people to appreciate that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it is, right? Yeah. It is. And it's it's been challenging explaining that. And we're also operating in beta, which means mm -hmm. we have a basic framework and we work it out. If it's, you're testing while working it out, you're testing while working it out. Yeah. Culturally, Barbadians just want it done before they yeah. even commit to anything. So that's one of the major cultural um, considerations. For the rural um, project, um, even though it's new, we haven't really um, sp spoken about it publicly, mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity to talk about it now. But it's essentially we're on 4.5 acres of um, of land on the east facing hillside, yeah. And we are pretty much doing bringing the same level of um, development where we're bringing art and creative production to the space. So we're yeah. going to have um, sculptures in 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 the green space. We'll be working with agriculturalists. We'll be growing food, um, and, right? And the nice. other part, the other part of it will be heritage. So mm -hmm. we're linking a lot of the African heritage things that people think uh, they think it's ritual, but yeah. it's actually the everyday, right? And and how the art and the heritage interlinks um, to to foster growth and development. So with wow. that one, the the fair has been we've listed in our risks column. Mm -hmm to be uh, regenerative is that everyone say, oh, it's so far, right? Yeah, yeah. And okay, Barbados is 166 square miles. It's really not that far. <laughs> um, so these these are interesting um, cultural things that I, that makes us who we are, right? Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, those are the, the kind of considerations that we've been, been working with. Um, yeah. But I do think that there is a, a um, you know, people want something different from Sun, mm -hmm. Sea, and San. And, yeah. um, you know, having that element of um, Barbadian culture, you know, um, tourists being able to experience that in a very authentic way, mm -hmm. uh, some of that is missing from the tourism product, you know. Mm -hmm. So even as you start to go, well, two things. One, I, I can't wait to partner with you when you get up and running because we're in St. Andrews as well. <laughs> um, stacking functions. Um, and, <laughs> and two, um, I, while, you know, from a project management point of view, yes, it is a risk. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, from a what is needed on this island point of view, mm -hmm. I think people are going to come. All yeah. right, so let's let's take another question from the audience. I know we have some more. All right, this question is from Will. All right, so Will says, Hello. there seems to be so many conceptual intersections between Wired and Union, particularly re your ether. Uh, can either of you see a partnership or collab in the future? Any ideas <laughs> what that could look like? Um, uh, I just stake my claim just now, Will. <laughs> what do you, you want to do, Kisha? What do you want to do? Um, definitely. So, so one of the things as we start to, 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 you know, go through our regenerative process at Walker's Reserve is we definitely, um, are looking at creative or artistic elements in, in mm -hmm. our design process, um, and how we incorporate large scale sculptures and art into mm -hmm. the landscape. Um, right. 
And when we get to that stage, it is 100% our intention to reach mm-hmm. out to local um, designers and artists to mm-hmm. conceptualize that space and to bring pieces into that space because mm-hmm. we want that space to be um, a space of cultural s- storytelling as well. Oh, right? Again, along the whole you know um, lines of uh, eight forms of capital. Um, mm-hmm. So yes, it's going to be a food forest. Yes, mm-hmm. it's a um, we're building biodiversity, but an element of that is also um, capturing some of uh, Barbados's cultural elements um, right. and making it a truly holistic space. So this that a hundred percent is where I can see us collaborating in the future. And mm-hmm. then as an element of education, um, we're constantly looking for ways to roll out educational tools. Um, mm-hmm. This this segment is is one of those ways. Um, right. Within the COVID climate, you know, we kind of came up with this. None of us are experts on how to do this, but we came up with this as a space mm-hmm. to share and to educate persons about what's happening in Barbados in the different forums um, mm-hmm. and to bring people into this uh, collaborative space with us. So I could also see a, a very huge element of collaboration in terms of us developing some type of educational okay. yeah. e- elements together, um, particularly for urban spaces mm-hmm. um, and built infrastructure. Yeah. So what do you I, think? <laughs> Sign the I'm dotted up. line. <laughs> <laughs> I am there with you. We are there with you, for sure. Uh, Do we have any more questions from the audience? All right, so this question is from Tammy. Um, Thanks for joining us, Tammy, on Facebook. Uh, What is the responsibility of practitioners of art design and making in the era of climate change? Oh, I think we answered that, Tammy. (laughs) I could answer it again. Um, should I ask her again, Kisha? No? Yes, yeah. you should. Yes, you should. You can't slap Tommy on the wrist. <laughs> Who knows? Tommy may have just joined. You should answer that oh, question again. Oh, Tommy, so quickly reframe it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so in a couple minutes earlier, I was saying I have a bias for design mm-hmm. um, where we speak about product designers and architects and fashion designers and people who make objects that are useful and beautiful. Um, it's important that we need to think about those things. If What value do they bring to humanity? Is it just another thing that just piles up in your garage or your cupboard? Like whatever we design, it has to have, it needs to bring value, right? Yeah, um, awesome. Right? Um, and does it have a long life? Is it able to transform after it's, you know, it's expired? Can it become something else? Yeah. Because even, I've even addressed this, even the idea of recycling is in question because it requires so much energy to take materials from a built form into its raw form again. So mm-hmm. it's not as simple as collecting all the pet bottles and exporting them and getting them reprocess like really think about what this object does and um can it live through three generations at least i remember when we had things like that right um so that's the responsibility of designers especially um to really think about products and serve and systems um that um help the environment um excellent Yeah. Let's see if we can squeeze some more questions in. I see that there are a lot of questions. Uh, so this is from Khalil. Uh, hey, Khalil. Khalil. From what you said, Israel, creative placemaking animates public and private spaces, rejuvenates yeah. structures and streetscapes, etc. For you, what are some of the outcomes that will mark success for the project? Oh, boy. <laughs> These are good questions. Where do these people come from? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Khalil. <laughs> um, so it's it's that's a really good question. Like, what? How do you measure success? Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things for me would be a holistic ad, um, adoption of, let's say, Union at Beckwith, that the doors are always open that people feel safe, that when they go there, they feel revived and 
they feel complete and they've connected. Um, for me, from that point, um, that would be a, a definite measure of success. It's not necessarily the money. It's mm -hmm. not how perky the building is, um, but how the activities that it hosts is able to change people's lives. Um, I'm hoping like within like two years of us being there that that entire quadrant starts to respond as well. And the response is not necessarily um, the activities, but the people that we partner with, other property owners can yeah. see past um, rent. Yeah. And, so right, you start you to have influence on the way that they think and the way that right, they to, design their spaces and the interventions yes. that they have on their spaces. Yeah. yeah. So right? it's so a that's collective a, change that's happening. A collective change. I think that for me, that, that would be the mark. Because I think what we're doing, no, what we're doing is actually quite transformative. Um, yeah. For a young, unknown um, uh, nonprofit, being able to partner with uh, an established private sector company, um, government on Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture, being able to partner and get those mm -hmm. things done, along with development agencies, because they see the value in it. Um, I think it's great. Um, and yeah. we're really hoping whatever we learned that we're able to share it with others and yeah. say, hey, run with this. This is our operational manual. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So start those... documenting it. Start documenting uh, it. You have let's a see if we... <laughs> let's Lower see if we I'm gonna I'm gonna that. sidestep that question and let's see if we have any more <laughs> questions from the audience. <laughs> All right. So we have a question from uh one of our YouTube users, Edgewaters. Uh thank you for joining us on YouTube. Uh Guys, we're live on YouTube and we also have our recordings on YouTube as well. Yeah. While creativity in schools is already lacking, how mm -hmm. would you encourage the educational sector to make use of and educate our youth through creative placemaking? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, so... One of the strategies for creative placemaking is also community and public arts. Yeah. Um, so it, you can use the art. Um, let's use it. Let's let's use the site again. Um, mm -hmm. There are challenges within, let's say, the communities in and around the city, right? You can you can use them as touchstones, mm -hmm. and you can use art therapy, using community arts as the basis of the activity. Right. Um, so this is happening in the classroom. It's happening outside. Um, and you're getting the skills and the interaction that's necessary, but at the same time, you're solving another problem, right? Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things we will be doing um, with Union at Beckwith is to have a community arts program um, we probably will partner with our friends in East Yard in Trinidad because they've been doing it really well. And we're yeah. not about reinventing the wheel right now. Um, it makes if, sense, yeah. If you have a successful program and we just rejig it a bit for the Barbadian context, mm -hmm. um, this is one of the things that you can do. So um, that is, that's the best answer I can give right now. Excellent. Um, so we're going to take one last question before we close off. Um, oh, we're done already? Wow. Yeah, I know that hour just flew by. Really? Right? All right. Yeah. So this question is from Karen, Karen Jordan. Hey, Karen. What about uh, temporary mur mur murals for dilapidated mm -hmm. buildings? Temporary mm -hmm. because some of these buildings will be pushed down. This no, they will not be. This is common in several <laughs> territories, but I'm yet to see it here. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. So... We're all about permanence with reason, right? Yeah. So temporary murals will require resources, right? So if you if it's a temporary mural, I think it's a great idea, but it cannot be, if you know this building is going to be demolished, it cannot be something that will end with the building. So let's think about extending the life of the mural. Maybe it's on a material that we then place onto the building we paint on the mural, and mm -hmm. then if the building needs to be removed, we can take the mural off, right? Yeah. Um, so it's it's temporary in the sense of where it's being installed. Mm -hmm. um, we we're actually will be painting three murals on all three of our facades. 
Mm -hmm. um, look out for that. It's called the B-Town Canvas. So we're going to have an open call. Yeah. And it's going to be a permanent mural um, because we're going to be there for a very, very long time. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Israel, this was a true pleasure, a very enjoyable and enlightening discussion about creative placemaking. Um, and um, it may seem like if we stayed off the, the, you know, the very scientific direction of climate change and regenerative agriculture, but we definitely were talking about very real life experiences um, and very real spaces that we have to in, you know, inhabit and how we can make those spaces um, that are part of our everyday life, um, for example, Bridgetown um, and other urban spaces, how we can make those spaces um, regenerative, um, but how we can also address issues of climate change mm -hmm. um, within those spaces. And even though addressing those issues, um, it may seem like it's just very small incremental movements, it all adds up to the overall thing. And if everybody in every urban city is considering or urban space is considering these these things in the way that they design and the way that they develop their buildings, et cetera, um, the way that they develop their craft, um, definitely it will it would lead to a change. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank um, you. It was really great to have you. If you joined us late and you missed any part of today's discussion, um, you can go to our YouTube channel uh, for the recording. Remember, it's as easy as click and subscribe. Um, join us again on Tuesday the 26th at 1 p.m. when CPRI's Jen Ward-Clark speaks with Veronica Prado energy specialist of the Inter-American Development Bank about the landscape of renewable energy in Barbados. And then join me again on Thursday 30th as I speak with Anate Mills, consultant advisor to the Office of the Prime Minister of Jamaica about the great 2020 climate acceleration and whether the current COVID-19 pandemic can help the climate crisis. So we really look forward to seeing you. See you next week.